Thank you, worship leaders. Fantastic every week. I hope you caught those words. Even when I don't see it, you're working. How about this next line? I want you to remember, you know how I feel about feelings. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. Which is perfect because this is what we're talking about today again. Passion and purpose, right? I mean, what is this all about? What are, what are we doing here? You may remember we just finished Passion Week. We had Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday. And, and that's often referred to as the Passion Week because Jesus showed us his passion for us and, and how much he loves us. And a couple weeks ago, I asked this very pointed question. What is it that you are passionate about? What is it that you're passionate about? You know, is it something that jumps to mind? Is it, is it gardening? Is it cars? Is it toys? Is it basketball? <sighs> it's okay. We can cry together. Your team lost. My team lost. All God's children's teams lost last night. It's okay, right? I can hear some of you passionate about it, screaming at your TV, and I'm sitting here going, I need to go over these notes one more time. Come on! And I'm looking, and you missed another three-pointer? Man, I could have made that three. No, I couldn't have, but some of us are passionate about basketball. Some of us are passionate about food. I remember when we moved to North Carolina, the home of the glorious, one of the healthiest chains on the planet. I was determined to raise my kids right. And I brought them and introduced them to this sign right here, the Krispy Kreme Hot Now sign. And amen, thank you. Can I get another? Amen, amen, right? There's just something about this. So when you see it, you got to pull in. But you know what? I was determined to really raise my children right. My wife was with me by my side being good parents. said, unbuckle your seatbelts. We're going in. I wanted to show them the heavenly conveyor of goodness and icing and sugar <laughs> and more sugar. But it's not just this I want to show you. I want you to look at the passion on my daughter's faces here. This is, this is uh, Mary when she was younger. If you look closely, you can see just the top of Mercy's head in the car seat. It's one of the little portable ones. You carry the little basket of joy around, right? She was young. But there's, some, <laughs> there's somebody missing from this photo. My son who's in the back serving in child care, got tagged in, he had to go serve and called up the reserves today. I want you to look at the passion on his face when I introduced him to this, okay? I just, I mean, come on. Look at the intensity in those eyes. Hands lifted the glorious. Lord, we thank thee for this bountiful feast. It, I mean, it, it can't get any better, right? He was passionate about that. Some of us are passionate about our sports. Some of us are passionate about our food and its shows. And some of us are passionate about our entertainers oh, and our, our singers. And I tell you what, I just read last week, I can't believe it, but apparently on the news, Taylor Swift's tour was classified as micro-earthquakes because it was so loud, so intense. Her fans are so passionate that when five songs came on, you know some of them, I think, what is it, uh, You Belong to Me and Love Story, but it really shook the Richter scale when she launched into Shake It Off. Raise your hand if you know that song, right? There's choreography to it and all kinds of stuff. And I, I, they, they, they said that the, the, the seismic meters, we actually have a picture of the seismograph that set off these sensors. It said that 70,000 fans inside SoFi Stadium were so passionate that a seismic wave of nearly 0.1 on the or 1.0 on the Richter scale came from all the people singing, jumping, and dancing around together. And I got to thinking, can that be real? <laughs> like, a Taylor Swift concert? I'm not a Swifty. I mean, I don't, whatever. But, like, I'm more of a rocker. And I'm like, how come you don't hear about that with Skillet and Striper and Metallica? Right? And I... Without even thinking, I read the next thing, and the researcher also noted that Swift has a largely choreographed show, while groups like Metallica tend to not have choreography. If you're gonna, can you imagine Metallica, James, up, up here, like, shake it? Mm -hmm. you know, they would get booed off the stage, right? But you have to admire their passion. So I'm thinking about this. I thought, you know what, James, we need to amend my question. Can we amend it to say, maybe better yet, what should we be passionate about. Because there's a hurting world out there that needs to see that we're pretty passionate about something besides Tay-Tay, Travis Kelsey, and all the sports and all the Nothing wrong with that. I mean, I, I love it. I was up late last night watching Bama lose again. But I just wonder, what would Jesus say if he was asked that question? Well, good news, church. He was. He was asked that question. 
What's the most important thing? What, is, what should we be, what, boil it all down. If you're not familiar with the passage, you can kind of guess where, where this is going because there's a famous line. It's actually where we get our slogan from, love God, love people. But you might have heard, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And that's what he was responding to a Pharisee's question. But because we know that kind of in our lexicon, we kind of, whether you're a churchy kind of person or not, I don't want us to gloss over that. So I chose deliberately a different translation. And I want you to see if a certain word jumps out at you. Look at it with me, Matthew 22. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your passion, all your prayer, and all your intelligence. Oh, wow, what a different translation. This is the most important, the first on any list. But there's a second to set alongside it. Love others as well as you love yourself. These two commandments are the pegs that everything else in God's law and the prophets hangs on. All right? You see a little different there? There's even a better translation. I love that. It's where we get our love God, love people thing in, 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 in our whole theme. But Jesus is talking about somebody comes up to him and they're trying to trap him. Hey, teacher, what is the most important thing? And, he, and, he, and I love it. He boils it all down. The number one thing in life, he, he says, I want you to love God passionately. Not halfway not phony baloney. He says, I want to, you to, to serve him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the gospel of Mark adds one other word. If you want to look at it with me, he says, love the Lord God with all your passion, prayer, intelligence, and energy. Ooh. Oh man, well that's a different word there. That's, my energy is in short supply as I get older. I don't know if you've noticed that, but sometimes things happen and well now that's, that's pretty revealing. All my energy so I went back, I looked, the original Greek word used here for the word passion is the same word used for the word heart. And what is the heart? It's the seat of our emotions. It's also a muscle. So Jesus is literally responding, telling us, guys, the most important thing is for you to love God with all your heart, all your muscle, all your strength, all your passion. Put some energy into it. In other words, don't just go through the motions. Don't be lukewarm when it comes to God. So you know, I got to ask, how are you doing with that, right? How are you doing with that? He's saying everything goes down to passion for the Lord. Don't come at it half-hearted. No weak spine, noodle leg, limp wrist, namby-pamby. Don't be a wimp about this. I want you to give it everything you've got. If you're going to follow me, I want you to do it with passion. It's the same passion he displayed on the cross. The passion that said, I will take your sin, because I love you so much. I love you this passionately. The Bible says we're to seek God passionately, but not only stop there, but love God passionately, serve others passionately, obey God, trust God, even when we don't understand it. We just sang those beautiful words to talk about. So at some point, hopefully we're all a little, a little familiar with, with the, the verses there. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But what a lot of people don't know is Jesus was actually quoting Deuteronomy. But every Jew sitting around listening to him, when he started quoting this, I guarantee you their heads snapped up and said, whoa, whoa, what's he saying? This is not a new command. He's actually quoting the Shema, the great Hebrew. This is their code. You might even call this the creed of Israel. I want you to notice how similar it is. Look with me here, Deuteronomy 6. He says, listen, O Israel, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God and the Lord alone. Okay, he is one. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Does that sound familiar? That's exactly what he was quoting. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your kids. Talk about them when you're at home, when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands. Wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house, on your gates. This is the Shema. This is the core of Israel. This is their, their creed, the heart of the Hebrew faith. This is what Jesus was answering when someone came up and said, what's the most important thing? So if it's that important to Jesus, the Son of God, it has to be important to us. He is saying the greatest purpose you can live for, strip all the noise and distractions away, is to live for God, to love him with all we have, heart, soul, mind, strength, time, talent, treasures, gifts, abilities, all your dreams. When we live that way, we're actually living a life of worship. And isn't that what it's all about? If you're new to the faith, or maybe you're joining us online, you haven't, you're kind of checking out this Christianity thing, worship 
is just a fancy word for ascribing worth to something that is worthy of your admiration, of your worship. It harkens back to the old English word, worth-ship. Your worth-ship. I give, you have worth. So I bow before, I esteem you. Does that make sense? I worship you. So you can see where it comes from. Jesus is saying, God is worth everything. And if you want to be a lover, a follower, a passionate disciple of Jesus, we need to be a worshiper of God. So we ended Passion Week right out of the box with this great sentence. We are not, by nature, passionate about God. I wish we were, but that's not our default setting. We have to work at it. The Apostle Paul said, keep your fire burning. Stoke those flames, right? Stoke that zeal. You must keep that energy. And then we looked at, we looked at the, the first three passion killers. The first one was an unbalanced schedule. The second one was one that hit kind of close to home for many of us, an unresolved conflict, some tension with somebody or something, maybe a work situation, or an unconfessed sin. Man, you can't let things fester. Keep short accounts. There's something wrong. Go to that person. There's something you need to confess to the Lord. Do it today. Don't let the sun set on your anger, your wrath, or on your sin. The next passion killer I want us to look at today is an unsupported lifestyle. Mm -mm, It's a biggie. Sometimes if you feel kind of blah and kind of just, oh, man, I'm just not feeling it today. Sometimes we lose our passion for God because we are not spending time around others who are passionate for God. We're spending our time around people only who bring us down or who wear us out. If you're not spending time around Christians that encourage you, whoo, who bring you up in your walk with God, if you're not getting any fellowship, I love this practical common sense verse out of Ecclesiastes. It says, two are better than one. Because if one falls, the friend can help them up. But pity the man, (laughs) pity the fool, who falls and has no one to help him up. A little Mr. T reference for those of you old enough to get it, right? Pity the fool who falls and has no one to help him up. Guys, can we be honest? We all fall sometimes. Every one of us trips. Every one of us struggles. And we need those great people around us. Hey, come on, buddy. Let's keep going. Here we go. If you've been part of PH for any amount of time, then you've heard what I'm about to say numerous times, but it is so important, I'm going to say it again. This is why we have small groups. This is why the bigger we grow, the smaller you have to go to find that connection, to find that that group of people who will support you. Your spouse cannot be your only support system. No spouse can fill that role. Your pastor can't be your only support. No pastor can. That is why we need a group of people to come. We all struggle. But here's the deal, guys. If we're going to go through crisis and we know it's coming, we know the storm's coming, the time to get plugged in and find that body, that group of believers that that, that rallies around, is before the crisis hits. Not in the middle of the tornado. It's too late. The time to do that is now in the peaceful waters to find that somebody like-minded people who bring you up, but also to celebrate your victories. It's not just for the bad times. It's a system to help us keep our passion alive when the difficult times And this is why we offer several of them. So many awesome options. I just grabbed a few. We got some on Wednesday nights. We've got some on Sundays. We've got some on Tuesdays. Many of these have child care going on at the same time so that you can come. Talk to Pastor Jason if you're not sure. Maybe you've been, you know, on the fence about this. You think, I should try that. Don't wait. Plug in. I'm telling you guys, I wish I I didn't have to say this, but I remember how 2020 went. It's another election year. There's going to be so much ungodly stuff said and done, and you're going to want a group of friends around you to help you go through tough times. I know people are predicting the end of the world tomorrow with this apocalypse, uh, I mean this uh, 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 eclipse. <laughs> and you all heard about the red heifers, and there's all kinds of stuff going on, and CERN's firing back up tomorrow. And I mean, it's, if none of that registers on your radar, you are not in the same rabbit hole groups I am on Facebook, I'm telling you. <clears throat> Sometimes you just got to pray to it and turn some of this off. God wants us to be passionate about him, and to do that, we need a support system. We've got to have people to come around us to say, hey, listen, I got your back. To also hold us accountable and say, listen, man, you're making some bad choices. You know, think of your family. You don't need to be hanging around with that person. You don't need to be, you know, we need this. I want you to put this in real terms. If you're in prison and you're being punished, you're already there, what else can they do to punish you? There's one thing they can do. They can put you in a room like this. You know what this is called? 
You know it. Solitary. Solitary confinement. Even in the penal system for punishing, we know we were not meant to be alone. No one was. This is where we go to punish. No one. Can, can I be honest? Some of us are living our spiritual lives in solitary confinement. And we wonder why we feel burnt out and alone and, and isolated. Well, it's because we are. But that's not how God intended it to be. I mean, you can do your best. I know sometimes you might have medical conditions and you can watch from home, and that's fine. But after a while, if you got the chance and you can be around people, it's like watching a fire on TV. <laughs> you can see it, but there's no warmth. It's like, you know, there's, there's no, you need that support system. This is how one of the ways we keep our passion alive for God. And I've been in ministry for over 30 years now, and I've seen a lot of people grow in their passion for God. Ooh, and I've seen a lot of people lose their passion for God. And I can say, looking, there is a predictable pattern that almost always happens. And it begins with a pulling away from God's people. Think about all your friends. Think about people who have gone through valleys. It's usually not when they're plugged in and actively engaged seeking the Lord. The first thing they do is they back away. They blame God, right? Or they pull away and they kind of start to isolate themselves. What does that do? That just spirals. Y'all, I watched my mom do this during COVID. When they shut things down, you can't visit her, and she just started to spot. She was not meant to be alone. And there are so many of us that are in isolation. You can see it every time. They draw back. They draw away from relationships. They draw away from things. So many other things come up that are just more important. You've heard all the excuses. Pastor, I can't do it, man. Spring break. I got to go. My kids are doing golf this week. I got ballet and musical theater. Mercy's going to break her arm again. You know, so I got that uh, underwater basket weaving committee thing I got to go to, and it's, it's been great. Well, my favorite, Pastor, I just don't feel up for it. I'm so tired. Oh, man. Oh, I'm going to address that in a minute. Soon or later, whatever your reason, when you're not spending time with the people who have a, a desire and a passion for God, you start to flame out. I saw an incredible interview with Greg Laurie. Uh, she was interviewing a Christian woman who was on the TV show Survivor. Have you ever seen that? Went to the Survivor Island, and, and they talked to this lady and said, okay, everybody gets to bring five, five items to the island. She's like, oh, great, I know exactly what I'm going to do. Shows up, Prudy says, oh, no, 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 you, you can't bring that. She says, what, what's that? You can't bring your Bible. She said, no, no, it's one of my five items. You said, I can bring it. She said, yeah, somebody's already done that. They pick something else. She relented. And she said, okay, I'll pick something else. You can't bring the Bible because somebody else did that. So she relented, and then she said in the interview, she went to the island with no Christian support and no relationships. But the thing that shocked her most was what began to happen in her life. She said, it was so rapid. I began to notice a change in my character. Things began to change, like the way she talked, the words she used, the unkind things she began to say, the attitude she had toward other people, jealousy, hatred, anger. All of this came, and immediately she started to think, I feel like I have fallen off a cliff spiritually. And then she made this incredible statement to Greg Laurie. She said, I didn't realize how weak I really was alone. You know, to that, I say good for her for realizing that. I, I hate that she had to learn it that way in such a public setting. But good for her for humbly confessing and realizing. Because the truth is, guys, apart from Christ, we're all weak. That's what I love about our church. We don't have to put on airs and pretend. I mean, we can all admit that if we're not walking with Christ, man, we're weak. We need him. We need relations with each other. You know? One of the big reasons I continue to, to try to grow as a believer is because I surround myself with other pastors. We have a group every month. I love it. I look forward to this. I carve it out. I've got a picture here of, of several ones. These are pastors from all over. You might recognize several of them. Some of them meet in our building later after we leave. This is awesome. Some great guys. We encourage each other. We talk about you behind your back. We, no, I'm kidding. We, we, have a, we have an awesome time. And we cry together. We laugh together. We pray together. And then sometimes we just say, hey, what's working in your world? And, and, we, and we, we, it's like iron sharpens iron, right? I've read that in a great book somewhere. And we come away feeling refreshed. Hebrews 10 says this. So let's consider how we can spur each other on towards love, towards good deeds, and let's not give up meeting together and let us encourage one another. I mean, Scripture tells us what to do. It's just a matter of are we going to do it. The fifth passion killer, whoo, an unclear purpose. 
<sighs> the muddy waters of no purpose. When you forget the purpose in your life, I'm telling you, this is a surefire way to kill the passion and direction in your life for God. If you don't know the purpose of your life, it's real easy to wake up in the morning and go, what's the point? Why am I getting out of bed? Am I just punching a time clock? Is that it? Is this all there is? You ever felt like that? Well, it's probably because your purpose got a little fuzzy. It happens. It's okay. Admit it and, and, and go on. Right? Life without purpose is just activity without direction. Right? It, it's motion without meaning. I, I heard this great illustration of, of an archer who had his bow and arrow and his quiver, and he, he would take his bow and get that arrow, and he would pull back, and he would aim, and thoom, let it fly, and that arrow would thoom, right into the wood. And he'd run over with his paint can, and he'd paint a bullseye around where the arrow hit, and the big thing, and he would loudly go, woohoo, nailed it. And his friend came over and goes, what are you doing, dude? That is not how that works. You're aiming at nothing. And he said, but I hit it every time, right? That's not how this works. That's not how your purpose works. There is a goal. God has a reason for us to get up. Isaiah 49, he says, I have labored to no purpose, and I found out I have wasted my strength in vain for nothing. God forbid we echo those sentiments more than occasionally. Passion and purpose go together. If you have a clear purpose, you're going to have clear passion. But it's got to be God's purpose. If we're it, if we're the end-all, be-all of, of our universe, <laughs> what a small universe. <laughs> what a pathetic universe. I'm just going to live for me. I mean, can you imagine how small? We have to have a cause greater than ourselves, something that gives us significance and meaning. And the more you understand God's purpose for your life, and the more you live those purposes, you're going to notice how you're more passionate. I want you to circle a date. I'm going to put a date up here. This is going to help some of us. May 19th, okay? This is going to be a huge day in the life of the potter's hand. Fresh off the press. I haven't even told my staff yet. The leadership is going to hear it today at our elders meeting. But May 19th is going to be a day when if you are struggling for purpose, if you maybe been struggling, this is a date you don't want to miss. We're going to have some special guests here. It's going to be an awesome day. We're going to stick around. I'm even going to feed you lunch. So you got to stay, right? We're going to have, it's not going to be real long, but it is going to be so powerful. We're going to, mm, I'm not going to tell you. It's going to be awesome. I'm not going to steal the thunder. Just circle that day because if you get to the point where you're, un, you're fuzzy, you're unfocused about why you're here, this is going to give you some hands-on practical things you can do today for your ministry, for your mission. All of us need to have something to look forward to. If you weren't here years ago, I, I preached a whole series on purpose. And one of them is worship protecting your time of worship corporately and individually. One of them is fellowshipping with other believers. That is so key. We've talked about that a little today. You have to have times of personal growth where you're reading God's word, not just Pastor Matt spoon feeding. It's got to be, you've got to feed yourself some. You have to have that time, morning, night, wherever you can do it to protect that time. You have to have a time of ministry, a service where you're giving out, where you're not just taking in and becoming fat, but you're giving out and you're sharing, you're mentoring, you're, you're being a blessing to somebody else, you're serving. And then lastly, a mission where you're sharing your faith with other people, doing something to advance the kingdom. And I want to I remind you guys, when you are doing something for the kingdom, you are storing up treasures and rewards in heaven. And there is nothing selfish about living a life that pleases God, knowing that he rewards his children. You know that? There is nothing selfish about living a life that pleases God knowing, fully aware that he does reward his children. That is part of his plan. So this is why it is so awesome. It's a, it's a win-win when you are on ministry and mission. The last thing I want us to look at is an undernourished spirit. Ah, yes, the undernourished spirit. You don't have to even get out of your bed before you realize there is a, a maelstrom of things coming at you to conspire against you living for God. There's going to be frustrations, fear, uh, well, there's, there's the four F's. Did I, did I write them down here? The, the frustrations, the fears, the failures, fatigue, everything greeting you when you get out of bed. Am I right? I mean, all of those things. There's going to be conflict waiting for you that you didn't anticipate, pressure and problem. Here's the brutal truth, okay? Just own this. If you don't nourish your spirit, nobody's going to do it for you. If you don't feed yourself, no, nobody can do that for you. You have to do that. How do we do it? But, well, for one thing, by living out those five purposes. Mission, ministry, focusing on God's word, fellowship, worship. And you may say, Pastor, this is kind of new to me. 
I don't really know where to start. You know, I've, I've been, you know, I wasn't raised in church. I'm not really sure how, how to even have this passion. If I'm being honest, I'm not very passionate about much. Here's the first step I would, I would say for all of us. Before you do anything, I want you to come back to the first love, to know the one who loved you first. I think we forget how passionately God loves you. And one of the reasons maybe you're not passionate about God is because you've forgotten that. You've forgotten how passionate God is about you. Or maybe you know it, but like me, some days you forget it. Like, I know God loves me, but I don't really feel like he likes me today. You ever have one of those days? I know my spouse loves me. I don't think she likes me today. I'm just going to hide in my room. (laughs) Oh, wow, that hit a chord. Okay, all right, you've been there. That's good. I thought that was just me. I mean, no, not just you. I think we forget. (laughs) I'm moving on. I think you forget that God is hopelessly in love with you. Exodus 34 says it right here. It says, for he is a God who is passionate about his relationship with you. Now, church, let that sink in. Let that sink in. That is awesome. Do you know how passionate God is about you? I think sometimes we picture God as this old man with like a long white beard and a flowing robe like Obi-Wan Kenobi. He's just, oh, yes, another one of my children, yay. Oh that's, that's a horrible British accent, I know, but that is not how God is. Think about how passionate you are for your children and your love for them, right? How much more is his passion, our Heavenly Father? Or better yet, maybe you don't have kids yet. If you're a dog lover, think about the passion your dog should, when you leave the house, even if it's just to check the mail and come back, your dog come running to you to greet you full of passion. There's, uh, there's Toby, there's, there's Doug Bell's dog in the middle there. Mm. <laughs> right? It's that guy. It's that guy. He's back again. They greet you and they claw you and they knock your stuff out of your hands and they're banging their tail against the dryer. Dong, 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 right? They're so excited. Think about the love they have, guys. How much more is the Father's love for you? How much more is his passion? I think so many times we get so wrapped up in our own world, we end up blowing him off, not meaning to, but we blow him off and we say, man, I'm just so busy. I got other things to do, do you? Well, Pastor, I got some important things to do. Okay. What's more important than God? Oh, you don't understand. I got to do that. I mean, like, I know, I know sometimes we kill a few minutes or two watching some Netflix or Prime Video. I mean, I'm a Disney Plus subscriber. I get it. I know full well Star Wars is dropping. The Acolyte, a new series. And y'all, they're not dropping just one episode. They're dropping two episodes to start with. Like a, like a bad drug dealer, like to hook me. You know what I'm saying? Like, hey, the first episode's free, kid. You know? I can't tell God I'm too busy if I got time for all this. Then I got to hold up the mirror and say, Pastor Matt, what are you most passionate about? Because where I spend my time We'll answer that question. I don't even have to say it. You know, we talked about passion. Our Ghana mission team's back, and sometimes they'll do a passion play where they'll share the, the gospel without words, showing the life of Jesus. We watched that, that clip that I showed a couple pictures last week of the passion play in South America where the, the, the actor was beaten, and he whipped him, and he was falling down, and the dog came out of the crowd to minister to him, to lick his wounds, and couldn't understand why. And, you know, and we have these great movies that, that we forget what he went through till we see it brutally put up on the big screen. It's called the passion because Jesus doesn't want us to forget his passion for us. And that's why we take the Lord's Supper. We say, this is my body, which was broken for you. We remember his passion. This is my blood, which was poured out for you. He says, I want you to remember how passionate I am about you. He stretched out his arms and he died saying, I would rather pay this ransom myself than to lose you forever separated. That's passion. That is passion. Some of you may be saying, you know what, Pastor? I hear it. Listen, I'm just not a passionate person. I just, I just don't feel that way. Hey, listen, I want to talk to you about feelings. Your feelings don't control you. You are not your feelings. You are more than your feelings. Some days I feel rough. Some days I don't feel like witnessing to my neighbor. Some days I don't feel like coming to church. 
but my feelings will lie to me. And as a mature disciple of Christ, I have to put them in check and say, don't tell me what I feel, heart. Tell me what I know is true. And I know he is faithful. And I know he is good. J.D. Greer wrote a great blog a while back, and he says, I'm concerned for those who base their understanding on how God feels about them based on how things are going in their lives. In other words, if things are going well, then God must love you. You're doing right. And if things are going bad, well, then God's mad. <laughs> he doesn't really like you. Because that is a lie that is based on feelings. But it's so easy to believe that lie, isn't it? It's so easy to say, you know, did I do something wrong? No, there's a cloud. Between, what, what, what did I do? Okay. Sometimes God's ways are untraceable. But to remind yourself, his character is undoubtable. It's unassailable. He doesn't change. That's us that do that. I want us to know in every situation, maybe you're struggling right now. This is for you. Know that everything God does is bathed in love, right? Because that's who he is. Strip it all away. If you have to define him in one word, originally, it's love. And I know that one day all this pain, all this confusion is going to be swallowed up in a glory that makes these trials not even worth mentioning. So we're going to end a little differently today. Band, you can stay where you are. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to go a different way. I, I, want to, I want to speak to somebody who may be at the end of the rope, maybe frustrating. It's okay to have questions. It's okay to have doubts. Right? It's wrong to keep them long term. Get to the bottom of them. Take them before the Lord. I don't pretend to know why that cancer diagnosis came. I don't know why they had to file bankruptcy. I don't know why that marriage fell apart. Now, frankly, I have a hard time seeing any silver lining in it. But I know this. God is good. I know that he is faithful because I know Jesus. And I see his character. And I know that just as God used that brutal, awful death for good, he brought the resurrection out of it, he can do it with your situation. And maybe you just needed to hear that today. There is hope. God is good. As Spurgeon once famously said, he says, if you're having trouble tracing his hand, what he's doing, okay, skip to that Spurgeon quote for me, then just trust his heart. If you can't see his hand writing, okay, just trust his heart. Lean into that. As you think about God's love this week, I want you to maybe take a moment. In fact, why don't we just bow? Just we'll close this way. Just bow where you are and just go through that, that mental list and renew your commitment to him. Is there an unbalanced schedule you need to give to him? Maybe in the quiet of this moment, just say, God, help me to slow down, to recharge, to quit being so busy and, and just bask in your love and enjoy your presence. Maybe it's an unconfessed sin. Well, just take a moment right now and just confess it to him. Jesus died to forgive you of that sin. Confess it. Bring it out in the open. Agree with him on it. Say, Jesus, thank you for offering forgiveness. Or maybe it's an unresolved conflict or an unsupported lifestyle. You've been trying to hang on to something that you need to let go or you've been trying to go it alone. Maybe today you say, God, I want to run to you. Bring me a group of people who bring me up, who take me closer to you. Maybe you've had an unclear purpose. Maybe you've just been living for nothing or, or yourself. And maybe today God's reminded you he has a purpose. There is a plan. You are not an accident. If you draw breath today, there is a reason he is sustaining you. Maybe that undernourished spirit is time to see the reminder, to draw near, to lean into him. This is your new season of growth. I challenge us to intentionally focus our heart, our mind, our strength, everything we have into following and obeying and living for him. Father, I thank you that you gave us your word you give us the Holy Spirit to stir up the, the flames of passion in our heart, God. Forgive us for the times where we've been passionate about everything and anything but what really matters. But I thank you for forgiveness. And we come running back to your arms and we say, Lord, make us on fire for you. In a dark world, God, may we be bright flames of purpose and love and joy, telling people the truth, but telling it in love. God, I thank you that you give us the privilege to come back home. Reignite our passion in the way only you can. That's our prayer as we go. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, before you dismiss, just want to remind you of two great things. Next Sunday, we can bring the lights up. 
We have Pastor Bill is back with the Ghana Mission Team. Stu is back. And I believe, do you have footage of the shoe boxes or pictures you're going to be able to show? Okay, cool. So we're going to see, finally, those 100 shoe boxes that we sent out. We get to see their reaction. They came at the same time. It's going to be awesome. Do not miss that, okay? So pray for Pastor Bill as he shares that. Pray for Colin and myself. We are taking the student ministry this week to uh, their annual retreat, their camp. Um, gets a little harder every year. <laughs> and uh, it's sold out, and they're putting us all in these little cabooses with different people and churches and stuff. And I like, I don't know if I need to bring like a CPAP machine or fans or what, but who's snoring and stuff. So y'all pray that we have an awesome time, but we can get our rest and not get sick, no broken bones going to be an awesome time. This is when the kids come back on fire. All right, will you pray for that? There's a few that may want to make a decision for the Lord. Pray for that that time as well, okay? All right, God bless you guys. You're dismissed. I love you. I hope you have an awesome, awesome week. See you next time.